Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Macular Society Virtual Clinic for September. Um, we are on a new platform. It is Zoom, but it is a Zoom webinar platform, not a Zoom meeting platform. Um, and I hope that um, has not made anything difficult for anybody tonight. I hope that you're uh, able to hear me loud and clear. Um, as ever, I am incredibly grateful to all our virtual clinic experts. Um, and tonight I'm welcome, uh, delighted to welcome um, uh, Michael Crossland and Kezia Latham, who I hope will switch their video on in a moment and their microphones so that we can see and hear them. That's absolutely lovely. So our topic this evening uh, is um, based around the support that's available to people with what is described as low vision. Now, I believe the official version of that is uh, a, a visual impairment that affects a person's daily life, but which cannot be corrected by uh, a new pair of glasses or contact lenses. Um, so this affects a great many people, of course, with macular degeneration, people who may still be being treated, but may still qualify as people who have low vision. And of course, for many people for whom there is still sadly no treatment, then uh, low vision is something that many people will be learning to live with. Now, there is a lot of interesting research into new technologies to improve vision, um, more than just the handheld, micro, uh, uh, handheld uh, magnifiers and uh, other uh, low vision aids and, and, and kit. The technology is really developing very quickly. Uh, and in some ways, uh, if there was a te technological solution to macular degeneration, um, in some ways that might be as good, perhaps, as a sort of medical cure. Um, if the problems of macular disease could be overcome in some other way. So it's a very interesting area, but perhaps a little in its infancy. So I'm looking forward to hearing a bit about um, what Kezia and Michael are interested in, in in this area. So Michael Crosland is from Moorfields Eye Hospital. Kezia Latham is from Anglia Ruskin University. Michael is an, uh, an optometrist who is based at uh, Moorfields, uh, and he's also a lecturer at the University College London. Um, he has a special interest in low vision and has worked with children and adults with visual impairment for more than 20 years. He's published more than 50 scientific papers on sight loss, um, and he is a member of the Macular Society Research Committee. Um, he's also on the board of the International Society for Low Vision Research and Rehabilitation. He's the co-author of a forthcoming book, uh, textbook called Low Vision Principles and Management, and he lives in London with his family two cats, lots and lots of books. Dr. Kezia Latham is an optometrist as well and an associate professor at Anglia Ruskin University. She teaches the topic of low vision to students of optometry and ophthalmic dispensing. And she's the lead clinician for the low vision clinic within the Anglia Ruskin University Eye Clinic. She's also the co-director of the Vision and Hearing Sciences Research Center at Anglia Ruskin University, where her primary area of research is in the management of people with impaired vision through the appropriate measurement of function. Uh, uh, and for this, she received uh, uh, the 2017 Neil Charman Medal for Excellence in opt opt uh, optometric research. Uh, and that was from the College of Optometrists. So she's also an editorial board member of the Journal Ophthalmic and Physiological Optics and an elected council member of the College of Optometrists. So we are in good hands this evening with some very expert people. Uh, Michael and Kezia, welcome to you both very much indeed. So as is the usual format, I'm going to hand over to you both now to give us your presentation. If you have uh, all our attendance, attendees this evening, and um, welcome to you all again, um, then pop your question in the chat and we'll come to them after we've heard Michael and Kezia's talk. So Michael, over to you. Ah, oh, I think it's going to be me that kicks oh. off in the first place, Cathy. Thank you ever so much. Um, so thank you very much, Cathy, for inviting us both to um, speak to you all this evening, um, especially this week because it's National Eye Health Week, um, which makes it very topical to, uh, to talk about this. So the way we're going to split this up is I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about low vision clinics, and then I'll hand over to Mike, who's going to talk about um, electronic low vision aids particularly. And then we'll talk about uh, briefly about a new research project that the Macular Society are funding us to do. 
that should leave us uh, plenty of time for questions and hopefully wrap it all off around the time that Bake Off starts. So um, there should be plenty of time to cover everything, I hope. So Cathy gave um, a really nice definition of low vision and what low vision actually is. I like to deal with a, uh, a fairly functional definition. I tend to teach that low vision is uh, applies to anybody whose level of vision doesn't allow them to do the things that they want to do with their vision. So anywhere where there's a gap between what you can see and what you want to see. And obviously that applies to quite a number of people with macular disease. So the low vision clinic is somewhere where you might get a low vision assessment um, to see how best to use that residual vision that you've got. And I'm imagining that of the, uh, the people that are watching this evening, there may be some of you who are um, quite established in your, in your journey with macular disease, who are perhaps very familiar with low vision clinics, and you've been there a lot, and I'm not going to teach you anything you don't already know. But equally, there are quite likely to be some people who are a lot earlier in that um, sight loss journey, and perhaps have been recently diagnosed with macular disease, and so the low vision clinic might be a little bit more of an unknown. So just to run through some of the details, um, where will you find a low vision clinic to start with? Well, that does kind of depend on where you're based because um, things are quite variable around the country. If you are in England or Scotland or Northern Ireland, then um, NHS funded low vision clinics are very often in a, in a hospital eye clinic, part of the hospital. But you may also find those clinics sort of have been moved out um, uh, into uh, local sight loss charities that you may be able to uh, access those services there. If you're in Wales, then low vision assessments tend to be done within high street optometry practices. So you would go and see your optometrist your, uh, in your regular practice for a low vision assessment because things have been devolved out in Wales. Now, as well as NHS funded clinics, there are private funded clinics, so uh, clinics that don't have an NHS contract as such. So I work in um, a private clinic, as, as it were, within the University Eye Clinic, whereas uh, Moorfields, the clinic that, that Mike's working in, obviously, is, is part of the NHS. So in terms of what happens in a low vision clinic and what might happen if you go for a low vision assessment, really, um, it's made up of three parts. So I'll run through those in a bit of detail, but the, the first part is to find out what you're having trouble with. The second part is to measure where your vision's at to start with. And then the third thing is to see where we go to bridge the gap to between where you are and where you want to be. So this first part of finding out what it is that you want to do, you can expect um, the first part of a low vision assessment to be quite a lot of questions from your practitioner. Um, who will want to know lots of detail about the things that you find difficult to do because of your vision, um, the particular aspects of the task that you find challenging, and maybe a sort of a priority order of what are the most important things for you to sort out. So if you do have a low vision appointment, it is worth giving it some thought before you go. Um, just have a think about what the most important things are for you to be doing and, and make the most of that time within that low vision assessment. So what sort of visual tasks are you having trouble with that maybe you think the practitioner could help you with, but also a bit wider than that. Any issues that you're having because of your sight loss, even if your low vision practitioner can't directly address that by providing you with a low vision aid, they'll be able to signpost you on to other services. So lots of questions to start with. And then the next part will be to assess your vision. Now, some of these ways of assessing your vision, you'd probably be quite used to um, having done in a regular sight test, but others might be a little bit different. So we want to assess your vision in a lot of different ways to see how it's going. The first thing might be to um, assess your visual acuity. So that's the sort of standard reading letters at a distance. So um, reading black letters on a white background where the letters get smaller as you go down the chart. And we want to find out what the smallest letters are that you can read so that we can sort of get a general idea of where you are with your vision. We then want to look at reading function. 
So not only do we want to know how, how small things can be in the distance for you to be able to see, but we want to look at the sizes of print that you can read and how fast you can read those different sizes of print. And both of those um, ways of looking at your vision, the, the acuity and the reading function, they're going to help us work out how much bigger we might need to make things to turn a task from something that you can't see into something that you can see with magnification, which we might be providing via a low vision aid. The next thing that we might measure might be uh, something you're not quite so used to. We want to have a look at contrast. So um, black letters on a white background is all very well, but the real world, it doesn't tend to be black and white out there. So we would often assess contrast by looking at uh, large letters, which get fainter as you go down the chart. And by working out how faint um, a target you can see, we can tell quite a lot about how important it's going to be to make things bolder so that you can see them rather than necessarily just bigger. And then we'll also want to have a look at where in your visual field um, your vision is better and worse. So people with macular disease often have vision which is affected more in the centre of the macula. Um, and if there is loss of vision in the centre, we call that a central scotoma. And we might want to assess that central scotoma or the level of vision within the, the middle of the visual field, um, possibly using an Amsler chart. Now, you might be familiar with that. That's the grid of black lines with a spot in the middle. And you use each eye in turn to look at the spot in the middle and see whether the grid is present or wavy um, around that central spot. And that tells us quite a lot about what's going on in um, very central vision. And it can also help us um, give you advice on the best places, uh, the best part of your vision to use. If the central vision really is um, not working well because of the macular disease, we can give good advice on which direction perhaps you might want to look away from the center in order to get usable vision um, being used. While we're talking about the visual field as well, we might want to assess the more sort of peripheral visual field um, and check that that's working. It tends not to be affected in macular disease, um, but we want to check it anyway. And that's the sort of test where you might put your chin on a rest and lights would flash up in the uh, side of your vision and you press a button when you see one. So all of those measures of vision, sort of central and peripheral vision, give us a much, give us a really good idea of where your vision's at at the moment. And then we'd want to bridge the gap and make that vision, try and make the best of that so that you can do the things that you want to do. And there's a number of different ways that we can approach things. I've already talked about making things bigger, making them bolder. To make things bigger, one of the key things that we've got is optical low vision aids. So an optical low vision aid is something that's lens based, quite simple. Um, and it might be something that you're familiar with, like a magnifier that you hold in your hand or put on the table or um, special lenses that are put in your spectacles. And usually within a low vision um, appointment, if magnification is what you need, then you'd usually try a few different designs of different low vision aids to see what suits you best. And then if you're in an NHS clinic, then um, those low vision aids would be um, provided to you free on loan. Now, progressively, of course, there's an increasing range of electronic devices that will also provide um, magnification. And Mike's going to pick up on those in a moment specifically to talk about some of the options that are available. But within a low vision um, assessment beyond devices, you would also expect to get other levels of um, advice and signposting to other services. So that might be advice on best use of lighting or how to maximize contrast, maybe referral to other services that you might not have been previously aware of, things like mobility training or emotional support, daily living aids, whatever's relevant to your needs. So even if your needs aren't specifically optical based, then your low vision assessment can sort of point you in the right direction for when, where you need to go. So if you've not been to a low vision clinic before, when should you go for a low vision assessment? Well, I would suggest if you're at the point with your macular disease that your glasses aren't giving you the ability to do all the tasks that you want to do, and your needs go beyond what your optometrist can offer you in a routine sight test, then a low vision assessment would possibly be helpful to you. 
If you think that's you, then how do you get to a low vision clinic? Well, again, that does vary a little bit depending on where you are in the country and what services are available to you locally. Now, generally, you can refer yourself to services that are based within a local um, sight loss charity or in an optometry practice. Um, but to be referred to an NHS hospital low vision clinic, um, you may need to be referred. Now, if you're not currently a patient, at, an active patient at the hospital, then you might need to ask your optometrist, or possibly your GP, to refer you on to the hospital for a low vision appointment. But if you are under the hospital, then it may be a question of phoning the hospital or asking a member of staff when, when you're next in the hospital. Now, the final point is if you have been for a low vision assessment before, when should you go back? Now, sometimes um, for a low vision appointment, you don't get necessarily a routine recall like you might do every year or every two years for your um, routine sight test. It might be left more up to you to contact the service again when you feel that you need an, uh, another appointment. Um, and I would suggest that an, an up an update on, on your low vision assessment might be a good idea, either if your vision's changed, so maybe you've had low vision aids which have worked very well, but your vision's changed a little bit over time and they're no longer quite doing the job that you want them to, that would be a good reason to go back. Equally, if your needs have changed, if you've got a new task or a new hobby or you've got a, a new computer or a new phone that you use at a different working distance from, um, from anything else that you've got glasses for, then that might need a different approach. And again, that might um, be relevant to, uh, to have another go at the low vision clinic. So that's a very quick run through of, of what a low vision clinic is and what it might do for you. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Mike, who's going to talk a little bit more about those specific electronic devices that we might use. Lovely. Uh, thank you very much, Kez. And thank you, Kathy and the Macular Society for asking us to talk about this. Um, I thought I'd start by just mentioning the biggest change I've seen in the 20 years or so I've been working in low vision clinics, which is that not everybody, but a large proportion of people I see now have a smartphone or another sort of high tech device in their bag or in their pocket when I see them in the clinic. And I know not everyone has a smartphone. Uh, my wife still doesn't have a smartphone. She, she's a, uh, very happy using an old fashioned phone and it, it's not for everybody. But the people I do see with smartphones often find they've removed some of the tasks which um, were visually quite difficult for. So what do I mean by that? Um, for example, I mean, you can use the maps function on your phone to find out exactly where you are. Um, you can get that to read the street address where you are to you or in uh, a large format to show it on the screen where you are, which is a little easier than trying to find a street name on a, uh, a road in an unfamiliar area with a telescope, for example. Uh, those of you in cities can use apps like City Mapper, which will tell you what the next bus is likely to be at each bus stop you're at. It uses the, uh, the location device in the phone to find out where you are, and it will say the next bus will be a 205 followed by a 76 and so on. And again, this is information which is on your phone. It can be read to you through a headphone or it can be shown on the screen, uh, which again is easier than trying to see uh, a moving bus at the end of the road in the fog, for example. And again, um, sticking with travel, there's things like the National Rail app, which will tell you which platform to go to for a certain train, which again is an easier task than using perhaps binoculars to see uh, what's on the train departure board at the station. So these um, apps which are used by the general population a, a large amount as well have removed some of the sort of more visually demanding tasks that people might have had to do uh, previously. Another big thing which phones do um, is to read things to you as well. So all smartphones now have different speech programs where your messages can be read to you um, and rather than interacting with your phone by trying to see a screen and see small buttons, you can dictate things to it and have the answers read back to you. And again, not everybody likes this. Some people much prefer using their eyes to access technology like this. But even people with quite good vision do sometimes like using speech uh, and so on to interact with it. And of course, you can also use it for your BBC sounds and audio books and other uh, sources of audio uh, entertainment as well. But the biggest thing about these devices is they have really good cameras and really bright screens and really quick processes now. Um, I do quite a lot of work with children and young people with low vision. And 
almost universally, they will use their phone rather than a magnifier to do any sort of task they need to. So what will they do? They'll take a photograph of something, they'll zoom in on it, and they'll be able to see on their own phone what they want to look at. So for example, you go into a, a cafe or a pub, you want to know what's on the, the specials board, rather than going right up to it or using a, a magnifier, you might just take a photograph of it and look at what's on the screen. And of course, the great advantage of this is people uh, might think you're being a bit rude and looking at your phone, but they're not going to be as aware of the vision impairment you might have as, as if you're using more traditional low vision aids. And I think that's one of the major barriers to using devices in public, in my experience, is that people don't necessarily want to draw attention to themselves with these other systems. Um, they nearly always have quite bright torches on as well. So if you were trying to, for example, find something in a cupboard um, or trying to um, look at a menu in a dim restaurant, then the, the torch, the camera, and the zoom function could be really, really helpful for that. And that's built into most of these devices. If that's not enough, there's various software uh, apps you can use as well. Uh, they're mostly free. The one I particularly recommend is called Super Vision Plus, which you can get on Apple and Android devices. It's developed by um, a low vision research lab um, in Boston at Harvard. Um, it's free and it has quite nice um, image stabilization and, uh, and other modes like that. And it will do things similar to electronic magnifiers. It will change the text to white and black and so on as well. I think it's important to say you don't need the most recent or the most expensive phone by any means. Um, my friends were about five years old and you can get it secondhand for maybe a hundred pounds and, and although that's still significant amounts of money, it's, it's not the thousands of pounds you may think you need for these devices. And allied to that, of course, people are using far more uh, tablet computers like iPads, uh, Windows tablets or Android tablet devices. And those are particularly nice for reading newsprint. Um, they're large screens, they're bright screens. You can hold them at a relatively comfortable distance and access information more easily. So the visual demand of trying to read a newspaper um, on paper, on fairly grey paper, uh, at a small fixed size is much more difficult than reading it on an iPad, where you could have it enlarged um, with the text more spaced out in whatever position you wish. Whilst on these sort of household technology things, a lot of people I see are using uh, these sort of smart assistants like Alexa or uh, Google Home or things like that. These are those boxes that sit in the side of your room and uh, may or may not be spying on you. Um, but they can be quite nice to interact with, to ask questions like, you know, what's the weather today or what's the cricket score or can you remind me to go to the pharmacy later on, that sort of thing. Uh, and again, these sort of non-visual based interactions with these systems can be, can be quite helpful too. Um, many of you may well use Kindles to read. Again, this is a similar approach to using an iPad. Um, they're not generally quite as bright screens, but again, you can get large prints, you can get text to, um, to speech on these devices too. And it's an easier way often to access print um, from a slightly further distance you might be able to with conventional glasses or uh, conventional low vision aids. Um, so I'm conscious of that I'm probably telling you things that you know and that you use all the time. Um, one thing which sort of links into the low vision clinic part of this is I think it's really important to tell your optometrist uh, exactly what devices you do use and what distance you hold them at. Because for example, if you're reading on a, uh, an iPad at let's say 60 centimeters, you're reading glasses might not actually be the right uh, correction for that distance. So making sure you've got the best setup for that is really helpful as well. And as I say, those are all fairly familiar things. I'd like to move on to some of the more high tech, um, more sort of advanced uh, electronic um, aids that people use uh, to overcome vision impairment as well. So I think the first thing to say about these is these are by no means necessary for everybody with low vision at all. In my experience, they're most useful for those with really quite um, severe disease, so quite uh, quite poor vision, who use um, maybe less um, information from their eyes and more from, from other modalities like listening. Um, but the first one I'd like to talk about, which I'd like to show you live as well, to see if this works, is called Seeing AI, which may well be something you've heard about before. This is a uh, free app which you can get for an iPhone or an iPad, so any sort of Apple device. And it uses the camera on your phone to read things to you. So if I, this might not work, of course, because this is a live demonstration, but that'd be a interesting information too. If I open it on my phone, then what it does is it uses the camera to read text to you. I'm just going to hold up the, uh, the book I'm reading at the moment and try and read the back cover. A thing on shimmering wonder. David Mitt, a thing on shimmering wonder. 
David Mitchell is not wonder if there is anything on Shimmer. <laughs> David Mitchell. So okay, it's reading the um the uh the recommendation on the back of the book, which is a Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell, which I quite recommend. Um, you can see how it works. It's not something you'd want to listen to a, a whole book uh, by using, but it's quite good for little bits of information you might need to get, like uh, a letter in the post or an appointment letter or a prescription or something like that. Um, it does other things as well. Uh, it will recognise products using the barcode, which we find useful sometimes. I'll show you that. Product. So I have uh, conveniently a tin of beans on my desk. Uh, I'll just scan the barcode with the, the phone. Sumo organic baked beans 400 GX1. So there you go. It's told you what my uh, what the, the tin was. So again, people with um uh, with limited sight who aren't necessarily able to see the label of things, it can be useful for that type of information as well to make sure what uh, flavour of soup you're cooking, for example. Uh, it does other things as well. It can recognise colours. It can recognise faces fairly well. And it has some, uh, some other sort of applications like that. So that's seeing AI. As I say, it's free to download and try. And a lot of people I, I know use that system. If you have an Android phone, the equivalent is Envision AI, as in E N V I S E O N AI. And there's also another app called Speak with an exclamation mark, which is the same sort of thing. Um, there's lots of other apps and technology on phones as well, which I, I haven't really got time to go into, but there's, uh, there's I'll talk about getting more information about this in a moment. The other thing I would like to talk about are the devices you can get which are made and um, devised specifically for with vision impairment. So the first of these is OrCam, which you may have heard of. This is quite similar to seeing AI and it's a system which will read things to you and will use a camera to, uh, to describe the scene to you or to read text. And it's a fairly small little device uh, which fits on the side of a pair of glasses. It's fairly discreet, particularly if you have long hair, you can sort of hide it behind your hair a bit. And it has a camera at the front and a speaker at the back, which will tell you uh, what you're looking at. Um, the other thing which we're particularly interested in at the moment are these um, other electronic head mounted magnifiers. I appreciate you may not always see the screen uh, and see what I'm doing, but I'm putting on a virtual reality headset at the moment. Uh, I can't see anything at the moment because it's switched off, um, but I probably look faintly ridiculous. Uh, this is a system which involves, I'll take those off. <laughs> which um, uses, in this case, a virtual reality headset uh, with a camera and a very bright screen in it. So if you put it on, you can see a magnified, very bright, very large and high contrast view of the world. There's various different systems like this available at the moment, made by different manufacturers. They're getting smaller, they're getting lighter, they're getting more powerful. In general, you can't walk around with these because it affects your balance and it's, it's a bit, you feel a bit seasick if they're moving ahead too much with them. But it can be useful for things like watching a play or going to watch a cricket match where you're sitting at one distance, looking at one thing, or if you're going to a lecture and wanting to see what's on the screen. So this one I've shown you here is called um, Sight Plus. It's made by a company called Give Vision. Um, other companies you might have heard of or see around are eSight, who make a similar device, uh, and Oxsight, who are based in Oxford, who have a, um, a similar system which is based on um, a sort of pair of binoculars called Onyx, which you can use. And these, as I say, they're, they're fairly um, bulky at the moment, but they're certainly, I think, the direction of, of where things are going in the future for low vision aids. So um, how do you actually look at these? How do you find out about them? Um, the Site Village exhibition is, is a very useful place to, to go and look at these devices. That's sort of the, uh, the major place where these manufacturers uh, launch any new products and demonstrate them to people. Uh, there's always one of those every year in Birmingham and in London, and they move around regionally as well. I think there's one in um, Cardiff in October, and then I think Exeter and Leeds are doing as well. I'm sure there's one in um, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So Site Village is worth searching for, perhaps um, going to. They're quite busy. It's often a bit of a, uh, a crowded uh, room to walk around. The Macular Society conferences, as you know, if you go to the real life Macular conferences, um, often the exhibitors will have stalls there where they can demonstrate these devices. Um, and in terms of getting more information about these, uh, obviously the Macular Society is, is a great source of information for these, uh, both for the helpline and the leaflets which are published, and also the Connect by Tech scheme which Macular Society run, which can help you um, with, with questions right through from how to set up some of the accessibility features on your smartphone, all the way through to talking about some of these very expensive devices. I mentioned expensive. Um, these things are expensive. Um, the, 
this, this, as I said, smart trains, you don't have to get a very expensive one, but it's still a, a relatively large amount of money. Some of these other head mounted things have cost thousands of pounds. Um, in terms of how to get these paid for, these aren't currently funded by the NHS. Um, although Kes will talk about the project we're working on to try and perhaps change that in the future to get more information on the, uh, the cost and benefits of it. Um, those of you who are at work, the access to work scheme will um, often make grants for these types of equipment if it's essential for you to, um, to stay in work. Uh, those of you who are students, the disability students allowance will pay for these sorts of devices often as well. And of course, I do see people who self pay for these things as well. Um, I do have a relatively large number of people who um, well, I've just seen a message I'll read about in a moment, um, who, who will, will self-fund these things. And of course, you don't pay VAT if you are um, sight impaired or severely sight impaired. The message which popped up, which is very relevant, is there's a, um, uh, Ron Barnett has said supervision for card box is free uh, and can be used with a smartphone and cheap VR headset. Uh, that's very true. There's um, relatively low cost. Um, and Google made one called Google Cardboard, in fact. Um, headsets you can put um, your own phone in and we'll have software to do these things. Um, and the other thing is if you're just using it to watch television or just maybe to look at video games or something, you can use a very cheap over-the-counter device and plug that into your own computer or your own uh, television. So lots of information, so I've gone through lots of different things. I think the three sort of key points I'd want to get across are, are I think it's really useful to, to consider using smartphones, play with the features, download the different apps and so on. Um, and even if it, for some people, may seem like a bit of an ordeal to learn this sort of thing, I think it's worth the, uh, the sort of time investment uh, in learning how to use these, these technology devices. Um, the second point I'd like to make is there are lots of things which sound amazing. The website's played lit, so there's lots of these uh, head-mounted devices, but by no means is that the only thing that people with low vision find useful. Uh, many people, I think, would do just as well with very simple devices you get from a low vision clinic. Um, but it's, it's very nice to know about these things and to be aware of them. Um, and finally, I think, as I said, just talk to your optometrist or the low vision clinic about the different devices you use, about things you have at home, and make sure you've got the right uh, glasses for these different distances. And now Kez is going to talk about how we're going to try, uh, with Mac Society's help, to get some more evidence on exactly who will find these devices useful and how beneficial they will be. So I'll hand back to Kez now. Indeed. I mean, lots of time for questions, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just briefly cover um, the, the study that we're about to start. So as, as you've seen from what Mike's um, shown you there, these new head-mounted electronic low vision aids or, or wearables, I'll call them just, just to make it, um, so I can wrap my, wrap, wrap my tongue around it. So these wearables, they're quite exciting and, and potentially they could um, supplement or maybe even replace the sort of conventional LVAs um, like uh, hand magnifiers over time. But of course they do come at this uh, increased cost. So if they're going to be cost effective, they kind of need to do more than just the same as an optical magnifier. Um, and because they're relatively new, when people ask us in clinic um, things like will these devices be worthwhile for me or um, which of these systems would you recommend we haven't had the independent advice to be able to give a proper answer to those kind of questions what we do know already is that these kind of wearable devices do improve visual function in terms of the ability to read letters on a chart like i spoke about before but then so do cheaper optical devices what we don't know quite so much about is how helpful these wearables are um, when you're performing everyday tasks in the real world rather than in the clinic, um, whether they affect a person's quality of life and whether they're cost effective compared to these lower cost devices. So do they do more given that they cost more? So the Macular Society has um, funded us to do uh, for a postgraduate scholarship project um, which, is, which is called Real Life Costs and Benefits of Wearable Low Vision Aids. So we're recruiting a PhD student, um, a scholar who's going to undertake a study that will compare the usefulness in daily life of these wearable low vision aids to lower cost options. So as Mike said, that is important because if these devices are cost effective um, and a good way to improve quality of life, then we can make a case for them to be funded and provided in NHS low vision clinics um, beyond the optical low vision aids that are provided at the moment. Um, 
whether or not they turn out to be cost effective, the study's also going to help us be better able to answer your questions um, about who they benefit the most and what they're most useful for and those kind of questions. And the project's also, because it's a PhD project, it's going to provide at the end of it, a trained low vision researcher who can hopefully go on to further work in this area as well. So where we're currently at with that project is we've just shortlisted candidates for uh, interview for the scholarship. We're interviewing those candidates next week. Um, and the successful candidate will be starting the project in January next year, so January 22. And there will be opportunities for Macular Society members to get involved in this project if they're interested. Um, in spring next year, she said being a little bit vague about it, um, we'll be recruiting um, people for telephone or online interviews um, about their experiences with low vision aids in general, um, and it, including these wearable devices if, if people do have experience of those, so that we can get a feel for the pros and the cons and the, uh, the sort of tasks we need to be concentrating on with our project. And from the start of 2023, um, we'll be recruiting people to enter a three month trial um, to compare these types of devices um, over a period of time. So it's all a little bit in the future and more detail on that in due course. But we would like to very much thank the Macula Society for funding this project in the uh, in the first instance. And I can assure you that we'll, we'll be keeping you up to date with progress on that. So I think that brings us to the end of the things that we were going to speak about, but we are more than happy to uh, try and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kez and Michael, both of you. That was incredibly interesting. So if you have any questions, there is a Q&A function uh, on your screen and you can pop your question in there. Um, and we've got um, plenty of time, way up till eight o'clock to um, answer any of your questions. So pop your questions into the Q&A function if you possibly could. Just before we go on to um, the, um, the, 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 main, the main questions, a little bit more about this, this study. So um, uh, how, how many devices are you going to look at? And, 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 and I guess, you know, the technology is moving so quickly, isn't it? Are you going, is the study going to be able to keep up with this? Because it's actually, you know, every few um, months, uh, a new bit of kit comes out, doesn't it? Or another version. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we do want to do is, is um, make sure that we, um, when we're choosing devices to go into this trial, we will choose, we haven't chosen specific devices yet for that very reason. And we will make specific choices of which devices go into the trial at the time that we're going to recruit in. So we've got the most up to date stuff. Um, what these devices do tends to be similar across um, devices in terms of what they're aiming to do in terms of um, making things bigger, giving more contrast to images, those kinds of things. So those are quite generic across things. Obviously, uh, each iteration gets a little bit more user friendly and a little bit lighter, etc. But if we are able to sort of tap in, so we want to tap into those key things that they do, such that you know, minor changes in formatting shouldn't um, make too much difference to, to, the, to the findings of the study. So to try and future proof it as much as we can in, within quite a fast moving area. So absolutely. And in terms of the types of devices, we do very much want to look at the cost effectiveness of these different, um, uh, these different levels of sort of price entry points. So we want to compare these sort of um, more expensive um, wearable devices to the lower cost electronic options, such as the apps that Michael's talking about, um, and also compared to sort of the standard care that we offer through the low vision clinics with optical devices at the moment, which I spoke about a bit earlier. So it's a question of, of saying, do, what do these wearables offer that's, that's in, in excess of what we can achieve with other options? Thank you. So one of the things that um, we often hear from low vision experts is that people are, are referred or attend low vision clinics later than 
would be optimal. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that very often hospitals, for example, refer people to low vision when all other options have been exhausted and, and so on. What, tell, tell me a bit about the, because there may be some people who haven't actually taken that plunge yet. What are the advantages of seeing a, a low vision expert sooner rather than later? Well, um, the, one can start having problems with visual tasks well before you are at a stage where you might want to, where, where things like sight impaired registration might be started to talk about or, or anything like that. Um, you can have a gap between what it is you want to do and what it is you can see at really rather minor levels of, of visual loss. And it can be very simple and straightforward advice that might help somebody to get over those issues that could be causing, you know, really detrimental um, difficulties in their life. But with um, somebody looking at where you are, where you want to be and recommending some potentially relatively straightforward solutions, some slightly stronger reading glasses, a better light and some good advice on how to use it, um, using um, a, a bolder pen rather than a, a, a pencil to try and, and improve contrast, those kinds of things. Relatively simple interventions can make a really big difference to how easy things are to do. So I, I think I would encourage people to not wait until they can't do something um, and then look at solutions that, that might make it possible, but we want to make things easier as well. So even if things are still possible, there's very likely some simple solutions that could make things easier and um, and, and just make life that, that bit more straightforward, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I think I'd agree entirely with Kez. And I'd also add, um, there's lots of focus on reading and, and things like that, but we're very used to being asked all sorts of unusual things. So don't be embarrassed to say that actually you want to go to cut your toenails yourself. Or you want Absolutely. to play this card Absolutely. game, or whatever it is. And that there's all sorts of daily living things which people sometimes say, Oh, I just thought I couldn't do this anymore. And as Kerr says, it can be very, very simple things which we can offer or just advise, which which make big difference to quality of life. So um, Light, yeah, lighting is a very Sorry. Light, lighting is a very important issue, isn't it? I think mean, people don't realise how important. Often people think that they can't read a newspaper, for example, anymore. Actually, they just need a really, really bright light. And as we get older, we all need more light anyway, don't we? And so, Absolutely. Although, ha having said that, I've noticed in the question, there's a question from Mariella uh, Graziano, which is really interesting, who says um, she has problems with light when it is bright. It's difficult to find the correct place to sit or read. Do you have any advice on this? And this is a really, a really common um common thing we hear the sort of mantra is big bright and bold to see well but the the brightness has to be in the right place so on a very simple level sitting with your back to a window on a summer's day is far better so the light's coming across your shoulder to see well and having a light close to the task you're doing so whether it's in the kitchen over what you're looking at or a reading lamp over your shoulder is is actually just because the physics of light the place the light is is more important than how bright the bulb is so you have a 100 watt bulb in old bulb notation in the ceiling, uh, but having a, a sort of 20 watt bulb place the, the page is much more important. I'm, I'm going to take Mike's. Um, I'm going to take Mike's um, show it show show and tell approach. Um, <laughs> if we get a light, <laughs> um, if a light is a long way from what you're trying to look at, it won't be as bright. It, 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 we, we want to try and increase the brightness, but we don't want glare. We don't want this glare that's going to make light uncomfortable. Either having it coming over your shoulder so it's not shining in your eyes, that can be good, or having it in between you and what you're looking at. So I've got this light here. If I've got that down here and I'm, I'm looking at the page here, you can, well, the, that's my hand, but the light here is, is very close to what I'm looking at, but it's also between my eyes and what, uh, and what I'm trying to see. So this is a bright light now, but it's not giving me any glare because it's, um, it's between me, my eyes and what I'm looking at. So it's not shining in my eyes. So avoiding glare is very important um, to try and make things comfortable um, oh, yeah, with, with light. Said, um, well, sorry, autumn and spring is difficult, which is another thing we hear a lot. Um, the sun's low in the sky, especially walking towards the sun, the wind is horrible. Um, any scatter of light, if your glasses are dirty, it will make it even worse again. If you have any cataract in your eye, that makes it much, much worse as well. 
Um, any advice on this? Some people absolutely love different colored um, tinted lenses, sort of um, filter lenses. Some people will tell you yellow lenses are the only ones that work or red or orange or brown or green or anything. And some people find these extremely helpful. Um, there's no real hard and fast rule, even with people with the same type of uh, macular disease. There's a variety of what colors people find most useful. People often do just as well with a, a brown or gray tint, but the problem with that is it also cuts out the useful light as well. So you don't get the glare, but also you can't see where you're going so well. So the other thing we often talk about is just using a hat with a brim uh, or a, a, a sort of tennis visor or a baseball cap, which you can dip your head down so you're not getting this horrible glare from the sun, uh, but you've still got this unobstructed view of the, the obstacle that you might be able to trip over, for example. It's difficult, um, yeah. but it's... Um, yeah, I, I think the, those are the big things. The me. other build on the tinted lenses is is that sometimes sunglasses, where you've just got the colour in the lenses at the front, that can be good, but maybe not as good as it could be. You can get sort of specialist over specs, which not only have the the, the tint in the in the lenses, but there's also a sort of barrier across the top and and tinted side shields as well to prevent the light getting in around the edges. And that that can be um, that can be very useful, um, you know, a, a useful build beyond just sunglasses kind of thing. Lovely, thank you very much. So another another question here is about um, um, someone who has difficulty with the contrast of sheet music. And I know that lots of people who work uh, or enjoy as a hobby music find this incredibly frustrating, don't they? Um, to read sheet music. And the question is, is there any? Uh, enhancing software that's available for yeah this, this is a really common um, thing as well especially if you're performing where you've got a dark room and then bright spotlights then you're trying to see the director and your music it's, it's really about as visually difficult as it can get um there's various ipad apps one of which is called four score as in f-o-r-s-c-o-r-e and what that does it down you download music onto it you can enlarge it on your ipad and then use um, a foot pedal if you need to to advance the next set of uh, uh, next set of bars. So you can swipe through it, or if you're playing an orchestra instrument, you can't do that. You can use a, a foot pedal to, to advance it. So that's four score. So it, it's yes, it's larger, it's big, right, and bold again. Um, that's probably the first one I look for. There's other ones as well. There's one called Air Turn as well, uh, A I R T U R N, which I know people have used. Um, I know. Um, RNIB Music Service are, are quite good at this sort of advice as well. So obviously Mac Society Helpline, I, I recommend a lot, but also RNIB Helpline have a specific music team. There is such a thing as Braille music, but I just can't understand in my head how that works. <laughs> and I think usually people can do well with, uh, with sort of tech things like that. Okay, well, I hope that's I hope that's a, a, of help. Um, somebody has asked about buying things like measuring jugs um, with you know high contrast or big um, measuring um, uh, lettering and so on so that you can read, you can actually buy things that talk to you as well, mm -hmm. can't you, I think? Absolutely. Um, the, in the first instance, I would suggest that um, your local low vision or your local vision impairment charity is very likely to have a resource room where these kinds of daily living aids are on show and you can, you can try them out. Um, now, again, uh, visual impairment charities differ in terms of uh, how big they are, what options they offer across the country. If you've got access to the internet and you can you can use your, your favoured search engine to search um, vision loss and your town, then you will usually come up with a, a charity local to you. There's also a um, uh, there's an umbrella organisation called Visionary. Um, and Visionary, if you go to their, uh, their main website, they have a charity search, uh, postcode search. So you can put in your postcode and it'll tell you your sight loss charity that's, that's closest to you, um, where you would be able to, to see if there was a resource room where you could, um, you could test out these things for real. There's also, of course, the, the RNIB shop, um, which has a lot of these, these different gadgets, um, if you're sort of London based or if um, you're online. Um, so that's a couple of different options for, for these sort of daily living aids. You can also make them yourself. Um, if you get a friend round and um, get some nail polish, nail varnish or, um, or some paint and you can spend an evening, um, maybe it's just me. <laughs> I always want to do things like myself. You can no, 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 no. I know plenty of people that do that, yeah. That sort of and, uh, uh, ask your friends to be creative about making these things. I've seen people do, do those. 
Good idea. Um, a, a question here from somebody who um, uh, crosses can cross the road, she says, but increasingly difficult to see movement in low light um, if a car is in shadow um, or, or, or there are no um, uh, running light, light, lights on. Yeah. Apart from guide dog, is there anything that might help with that? I, I mean, crossing roads must be quite an intimidating thing to do in low light. Plus the, um, the, the silent cars as well now, the electric vans and electric cars are, are a big problem as well. There's a lot of debate about this because, of course, the owners should be on the driver and the car technology, not on the individual crossing the road. So although people are developing things which relate you to, um, to the, the presence of, of cars, then um, I think it's, yes, there's some sort of political debate about that. Mobility training is probably the best thing to speak to the local mobility team. Um, the access into them is through your local sensory impairment team in your council, whichever council you pay council tax to. Uh, they can talk to you about strategies like scanning effectively for crossing roads, um, like um, using the tactile markers to find where the right place to cross the road is, um, and another sort of strategy you may not have heard, have heard of. But this is a, this is a significant problem, um, and it is something which, which the sort of research community is, is, is actively working on as well, because it's obviously such a big safety thing. Um, so the, the, apart from the advice we'd give anybody, um, you know, a child learning to cross roads, like always crossing it, crossings, always making sure cars are stopped and so on, there are other things which mobility people can do as well. I think mobility training gives people a lot of confidence, doesn't mm. it? It can, it can reassure people about some of the techniques that are used, but clearly the safest thing is to cr only cross at crossings when, the, when you can hear the... But of course, that's not always, always practical. It's not always available, is it? No, that's right. Um, a person here has wet, stable wet AMD. Um, the dry underlying doesn't seem to be getting any worse, but reading is now becoming difficult owing to a lot of floaters. Now, she's been told that there's nothing that can be done about this, um, but um, but is there anything that can uh, help somebody who's afflicted with a lot of floaters? It's tricky. I mean, magnification can help because then the thing you're looking at is larger in comparison to how big the floater is, if that makes sense. So if your floater is a certain size, you're looking at print and it's obstructing half the words, that's very difficult. If you make the word 10 times bigger, it's then obstructing just half a letter. Um, Lighting again is really important. Some people find that the light is brighter, they'll get um, the, fo the photos become more in focus, um, but other people find having tinted glasses can help reduce that um, as well. So lighting and contrast are important as well. It, it, it's difficult, I know. Um, yeah. But yes, so, uh, again, lighting is perhaps a key to that. Yeah, so there's another question as well about lighting. So perhaps we'll talk a bit more about lighting then. Um, somebody wants recommendations for the kind of lights for reading reading, reading and colour temperature. So mm. this is a big issue, isn't it? The, the temperature of the light. It, um, and we don't mean by that the heat that it's putting out, do we? We mean the quality of the light. Exactly that. So they talk about different... Um, a warmer light, as you call it, sort of yellow or orange light, has a different colour temperature, a lower colour temperature than a very bluish light, like some of the first energy saving ones were. Um, again, it's very individual. Some people do far better with some colours than others. It's, it's, it's worth trying um, yourselves. Um, the more blue a light is, the more the light will scatter in your eye, and theoretically, the more glare you'll get from it, which is why often people prefer the sort of older, warmer LED colours rather than the, the blue. But then you'll see other people who say it's just not bright enough with that. Um, so it's been a little, there's been a little bit of research on on this sort of comparing how well people do with different um, colour temperatures of light. So the warmer light, the cooler light, etc. Um, and there isn't any way that we know to predict who's going to get on better with what colour temperature. Um, the research that's been done suggests that some people do express a preference for one colour temperature over another. And those people who do express a colour preference, uh, a preference for a colour temperature, do tend to read faster with that colour temperature. But you can't predict who's going to like which colour temperature. So it is very much a question of, um, 
trial, <laughs> trial and error, um, uh, or as Mike, Mike put it better, individual, um, individual variation. So really the best way is, is for you to try um, a warmer light and a cooler light. What I would tend to do in a low vision examination, because a lot of the, the optical low vision aids are, are illuminated these days, and a lot of them have an option for a, um, a cooler or a warmer color temperature. So once I've identified a sort of a low vision aid, which, which might be helpful to somebody, say an illuminated hand magnifier, once we've found the right power for them, I'll probably then show them the, the cooler light and the warmer light and see if there's a preference. And if there is a preference, then the person can have the one that they like best. If they all look much the same, we tend to go with the middle one. Mm. And LED and I, is a big thing now, isn't it? Can you get different temperature LEDs as well? Yes, yes, yes mm -hmm. you can. And I was just going to answer Josephine Trafford Owen's question as well, which is very similar, actually. She asks, is it worth paying a large amount for lamps that claim to be daylight? Again, some people would do far better with those and would say, yes, it is. Others would say, no, it, it's, it's just as good as a, as a, a cheaper one. Yeah. I, it's I've, difficult I've, with the pandemic, but just going to Ikea or John Lewis or somewhere with some lights and, and playing with them is actually perhaps the easiest thing to do and just see what, what works best for you. Um, yeah, close to the page and, and some people will prefer one, some the other, but the money isn't always related to the success you'll have with it. I think it's fair to say. I'd agree with that. Yeah, so it is so individual. And I guess with all low vision aids, whatever they are, it's try before you buy, isn't it really, if you possibly can? Yes, very much so. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it is, uh, with, certainly with the optical low vision aids, it is one of the advantages of a, um, of a low vision assessment in, is in that you would have a practitioner with you who's able to guide you in a structured way through trying the different devices to come up with the right combination of design, magnification, colour temperature, etc. That's, that's going to suit you best um, from, from the options available. A lot of these things can be done, you know, by your, you know, by trial and error yourself. But if you have got somebody to, to, that can walk you through the steps with some of these things, then it can be helpful. Jolly good. Um, uh, Hannah, I have a question from Hannah, who is, um, says that she has, in, she's having injections and she has um, uh, uh, a dark shadow. She sees on the ceiling first thing in the morning and wonders whether this is fluid on her eye or damaged cells in the eye. I, this is quite common, I think, isn't it, to see this shadow first thing in the morning. What what could be the explanation for that? There's people, as everyone in this group knows, people often don't see their scotoma. They don't see the, the, the area it doesn't see with macular disease uh, because your brain fills in around the edge. And it's, um, uh, as you know, you, you're sort of filling from the surrounding features. But there is some research showing that the first thing in the morning, particularly looking at the ceiling in bed, people will see their own blind spot, if you like, before the eye. Uh, the brain starts filling in so it's most likely that's the effect the fact it's getting better during the day and isn't bad all day is, is reassuring obviously anything new or different or unexplained you, you should contact your your retinal doctors about but i think the um yes it's not uncommon for people to actually see that little sort of gap in their vision and then for the brain to fill it in as you you wake up a little more and the um the filling in process starts working more Okay, so she can be reassured about that. That it's yeah, I, th I think as long as it's, it's right not something which is getting worse, then that's that's not uncommon to hear that. Okay, so if you if you had one um, take home message then for our audience this evening from both of you, what is your take home message? <laughs> this bit of low vision advice you could give anybody. I sprang that on you, didn't I? <laughs> oh, yeah, um, I will go for. Um, get yourself a routine sight test, um, a regular sight test. Um, with your optometrist and if your vision is not um, allowing you to do the things that you want to do then either ask your optometrist what they can offer in terms of low vision um, support or ask your optometrist to refer you for a low vision assessment sooner rather than later. Excellent. Michael? I, I think mine would be don't assume technology is not for you. Um, you know People use technology successfully with, with no vision at all, with absolutely no perception of light. Um, and people of all sort of ages and backgrounds looking else I see using it um, successfully. Um, so if you're not somebody who's familiar with using smartphones and so on, consider it. And if you are someone familiar with it, then download some of these things we talked about and have a play and let us know what really works for you. Because it's always, we learn by people's experiences. 
Brilliant. Thank you both very, very much indeed for uh, all your contributions. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, now, um, Hannah, who asked a question earlier, has some other questions about injections, and I haven't put them to our guests tonight because they're not injectors. But next month, our guest on the virtual clinic is Adam Apani, who is a nurse consultant at Moorfields Hospital uh, and one of the pioneers of nurse injecting, which is actually one of the developments in the NHS that probably saved NHS uh, wet macular degeneration services from being completely overrun. So Adam is an e expert on this. So with your permission, I'm going to put those questions to him next time, Hannah, so I hope you'll be able to join us then. Uh, people have been asking about a list of the apps that Michael mentioned earlier, and we'll try to provide that, Michael, if we can, uh, by email, if that's, yes, if that's that all right. Um, and do please listen to that fantastic advice about seeing your optometrist uh, and don't be afraid of technology. We know so many uh, people are, but uh, actually it's a revelation when people can get to grips with this. And Michael very kindly mentioned our Connect by Tech service, which is available free. It's, it's a one-to-one -one, um, remote, but nevertheless one-to-one -one service. And you can access that through um, um, our advice line. And the number for that is 0300 30 30 111 and you ask for the Connect by Tech service, and you will be put in touch with either a member of staff or a volunteer who is an expert in the area that you are looking for help in. So please do use that service, uh, nine to five, uh, the helpline advice line is open, and that number again, it's on our website, but it's 0300 30 30 111. I do hope you can join us next month. Kez and Michael, thank you both very, very much indeed for being our guests on the virtual clinic this week. I hope everybody enjoyed it, found it useful, and I hope you'll be able to join us again next month. Have a very good evening. Goodbye.